All right, okay, we're getting started now. We're recording. So today, uh, we're just going to go over the exam, each question, and, and discuss in detail. Um, so people did a bit worse on it than I was expecting, but of course it's curved. Um, I mean, at the end of the semester, we'll kind of curve across all projects and all things, but this, this, uh, this scale here will give you a rough idea. So say if you've got like an 85, you shouldn't feel really bad about it. Um, if you're on the lower end of here, if you're, say, like getting below uh, 54 or so, then maybe you have to start worrying a little bit more. And if you're at the far low end, like you should probably um, talk to me if you're planning on sticking with the course. Uh, so a lot of people really put um, some funny comments in their paper, so thank you for that. Uh, otherwise, you get, it did get really tedious, but that helped make it less tedious. Uh, I didn't realize this, but apparently uh, there's some Slim Shady song, and there's like a bunch of references to that that I didn't get. <laughs> So I went and watched that music video, and I realized you all had terrible taste in music, and then I like got <laughs> points for that. So no, you didn't lose any points. But, but is it? It was it was so obnoxious. I hate that music. But, um, so well, that's just my opinion. Well, I'm the greater. So uh, so then other people like Carter had this great comment that he bets they use Vim. I agree. They like next time that should actually be a question. They use Vim, and then you'll have to say that's wrong. So. Uh, for the grading, uh, this has been my first time ever grading anything, so I'm trying extra hard to be fair. Uh, so there are several things I did for that. One is that you only put your name on the first sheet, and I flipped that over and then shuffled everything. Uh, so when I was grading you, I didn't know who you are, so um, I wasn't showing any favoritism of any sort. And then second, I uh, recently read this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. How many of you have read this? This is a really good psychology book that you should all be reading. Um, but, but what, one of the things they showed in there is that if you look at judges uh, who are deciding probation cases, right after lunch, they're several times more lenient than several hours in. Oh, you read it. You've heard of it. Yeah. So basically, you're much more lenient if you've just eaten. So to take that into account, I only graded, like, say, two or three questions at a time. And then I would eat a snack, and then I would randomly reshuffle again. So everybody would uh, probabilistically have some of my grading done right after I had eaten uh, some ice cream. And that's probably also why you might have marks on your exam, so sorry for that. Uh, the third thing is, is like a lot of these, uh, it, it wasn't so... What's that? Oh, is there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, so the, the third thing is that like some of these, it's like very subjective. I don't, wasn't sure always I knew what you were trying to say. Um, so arguing is encouraged, right? Uh, because then you can be happy with the score you have. And then also, if you're arguing for something that's wrong, hopefully I can show you uh, what's wrong with that. So, um, like, if you come and argue, your score can only go off. So, uh, and if there's a lot of people that want to debate, then we'll have to set up something more uh, formal. So, 74 people took the exam total. Um, six of those had uh, conflicts. They had to take an alternate exam. Um, uh, we tried to uh, write the alternate exam to be fairly close, but if when we were ever in doubt, we would err on the side of making that one harder, uh, just to discourage people from uh, taking the alternate if they didn't have to. So I think, I think we did a pretty good job there. The overall average was 65%, and then for the alternate it was 61. So that's within the noise. It's probably about, about the same. So let me show you the grade distribution, which is right here. So here along you, ha uh, you have all the, uh, so along the x-axis you have all the 74 students that took the test. I sorted the students by their score. Uh, with the highest scoring students on the right and the lowest scoring students on the left. So um, one person actually did get 100%, so kudos to you. Uh, I was actually surprised by the distribution because usually you would expect some sort of normal distribution. But you see that this is, this is flat, so it's almost like your grades were uniform uh, random. So I don't know what that means. But um, hopefully, with, uh, hopefully with the grading scale we had, you won't feel like too terrible if you, um, if you got a lower, lower grade. So what else? OK, so here's the way I want to go through it today. So some of these questions a lot of people did very well on, and some did not. I'm going to go through the hardest questions first. So that then if we get to a point where um, we've answered everything you got wrong, you can just leave if you want. So you don't have to um, see me talk through the, the easier questions. So uh, by far the hardest question that people got an average of 3.5 on was question three. Uh, th this is really a terrible question. I, I regretted doing it because people interpreted it like three different ways and it made it really hard to grade. Uh, so you see there's a lot of zeros. 
well, first, so what, what is a question? It's, a, it's saying that we have, uh, we have our TLB, but the difference is, is that we got rid of the protection bets, right? We're using those extra bits and hardware to store more entries instead of using them for protection, so we should have more space. And then uh, it's saying, but however, we still have protection bits in the page table, and then basically I'm trying to get you to reason about what kind of security you have after that. Right? So, I mean, some people would have a very simple answer. They'd say, like, there's no protection bits, therefore memory isn't protected, therefore you should add protection bits. Like, you would get a zero for that. Uh, not really reasoning through much there. Um, another thing that I would, a lot of people said that I would give zeros for is if you just assumed that the application itself could be changing the TLB. Right? Like, that's not, a, that applications themselves don't really update the TLB. Like, you could have uh, a hardware managed TLB, in which case the hardware will be do a page table walk and update entries, and at that point the hardware would be checking the page table protection, or you might have a software manage, in which case the OS would decide what to insert, but you would never have uh, the process itself inserting entries into the TLB. So this is, the question is interesting because just because we don't have these protection bits in the TLB doesn't mean that applications can do anything they want. Right? So what I was really trying to get you to do is reason through uh, the, limit, the limits of the security vulnerabilities here. So uh, people interpreted this different ways. One people in, way uh, people interpreted that I didn't expect is that uh, you still have to check protection bits, so you would just check the page table every single time. Um, and then they said, so the protection is correct, but it's just slow. Um, that would get full credit, um, although it wasn't an answer I was anticipating. Um, the answer I was really looking for is I was hoping you would say that you can attack a process if you are sharing um, some physical pages with them, right? So you aren't, it's not that you're sharing the same TLB entry, it's that you each have your own TLB entry and those both map different virtual pages to the same physical page, right? So that would often happen in any case where you had some shared library and two different processes were sharing the same code. If you don't have these protection bits, then process A could modify that code and then process B would start running that and that would be bad, right? So kind of, People also interpreted like the points one, two, and three differently, so I just tried to understand what you were saying, and, and if you understood what was going on, I, I gave points, but kind of the way I look, look at it is that you cannot target a specific process uh, because you have to kind of be lucky to be sharing uh, code with them. Um, uh, but the question two isn't really right, because I mean, that you do are probably sharing code with some people, so you wouldn't really say that you can't attack anybody. Uh, and then finally, uh, you shouldn't really be able to attack the OS, because the OS is not even... Uh, using uh, virtual memory when it's in kernel mode. So there shouldn't be any case where a uh, virtual page and, and that the kernel is using maps the same physical page as something that uh, a process is using. So any general questions about that? I mean, uh, I imagine people debate this a lot because there's a lot of low scores on it, right? It was a, uh, I mean, most people got zero, right? So um, if you have kind of a general question, uh, we could, I could take that now. Okay, so yeah, you can talk to me later if you feel that uh, the score was unfair. Um, so the next hardest question was question nine. Let's go look at that. So. Yeah, so this was, this was kind of a tricky question. Uh, so first off, like I intended to put two bugs in here. And one of those bugs was that when we were getting the total ticket count, we were not counting runnable processes, right? And then later we did count runnable processes, right? So if we're holding, in, let's say like only 50 tickets are runnable, but there's 100 tickets total, then you know if we get this random out of 100, then half of the time there would be something runnable and we wouldn't be running it, right? And I feel a little bit bad because I mean, maybe the project actually made this more confusing, right? Because in that case, we were like giving leftover tickets to spot processes, uh, but that's not what the question said. This is just straight up lottery. And this is not the correct implementation of that, right? Because we aren't doing the lottery of everybody who's runnable. Uh, so that was one bug. That, that was worth eight points because I thought that, that was the main thing. Uh, another annoying thing that I probably did was that this isn't off by one. This should be less than. Imagine if everybody had exactly one ticket. And uh, then it, since it's, it's less than or equal to, then, uh, then imagine if it was either ticket zero or ticket one would cause the first process to win, right? So this should just be less than here. Um, some people got mixed up that we were doing subtraction off of winner instead of adding up a ticket count. Um, either way worked, so you didn't get any credit for pointing that out because this is correct 
Besides that, there was only one person that caught a bug that neither I nor anybody else in the class caught, and so I was very impressed with that. So even though they didn't catch my bugs, they got full credit. Um, that bug was that if ticket count is zero, what happens if you do something modulo zero? Yeah, it's basically, it's like a division by zero, right? So that this would actually like crash whenever there was no processes runnable. So that person got full credit. Um, other things I gave credit for is uh, somebody said, oh, well, you didn't initialize, like there's, there's no place where winner is defined. Um, so I gave two points for that. I could, I could, if I wanted to be harsh, I could argue, well, it's global and stuff, but that probably doesn't make a lot of sense because if you have multiple CPUs, you'd want that to be a local variable. Um, so I gave two points for that. Uh, another very common answer that I did not give points for is people said you have to add locking, uh, locking to this function. And imagine, okay, so there's two possibilities, right? The, the code that's calling this is already doing the locking, or it's not. If the code that's already calling this is doing the locking, well, then it would be a bug to lock here, right? But let's say it's not. Well, then we have a problem, because if, if we're doing any, uh, a lottery, and then we release the tickets, and then somebody else reacquires the tickets when they actually do the scheduling, well, then you have a window of opportunity where somebody else could be changing the state of the process, and it would be a race condition, right? So just by looking at this code, you should be able to assume that the lock is held when this is called. So I mean, I didn't deduct points for saying that, but I didn't really give you anything for saying that because you should have probably been able to guess that whoever was calling this had the lock. So any questions on that one? Okay, so let's go back to, so we're getting to easier and easier questions. The next one was question eight. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so this was the condition variable one. I, I felt kind of bad for this because the schedule was kind of confusing because we covered part of this chapter even though it wasn't shown on the schedule, but, um, and some people wrote that on there that, oh, you said we wouldn't cover this, but we actually did send an email explicitly saying that we would cover part of this. So, sorry for the miscommunication, but I guess the question is still there. Uh, but basically, what, what were we trying to do? So what, what I told you is that we could use condition variables for the limited case of a join, and that could be on the exam, and that's exactly what this is. Basically, uh, the child is signaling the parent when it's done, right? And the, and the parent needs to wait until that happens. So there's no, there's no bug in this child or parent code here, but I actually show you the implementation of uh, condition wait and condition signal, and there's a bug here. And the bug is that you should have remembered from class, right, that for this, these condition variables, we need atomicity. We need to be able to unlock and go to sleep in the same step, right? So that's what you should have been on, on the lookout for. See that we don't have any operation here that does that. Uh, basically, it's unlocking and then yielding. So you can imagine the parent calls this condition wait, and then as, as the parent is about to go into a sleep here um, with the condition wait, it could unlock it, and then the child could quick run and send the signal, and then the signal would be missed, and then the parent would sleep forever. So that was the main question. So I, I feel a little bit bad because it was like 10 points for that. So if you didn't see it, that's kind of uh, rough. Other things, like people, we, we goofed a lot of other things on here, so I also felt bad. Um, for example, we ended up copying some C++ code, so this is not valid C code. Uh, if you notice that, you got like three points for that. Also, was, like I feel so sloppy, but we didn't, we didn't like initialize these things, so I gave a couple points if you pointed that out. Um, Sometimes like you should have had a return value and we didn't return anything. So, like I gave a point or two. So kind of the way this is working is that if you saw everything I saw, you got 10 points. So I'm not requiring you to see things I didn't see. However, if you see other things that I didn't see, you'd still get points for that. So kind of there's more than 10 points in this question and it just saturates at 10 is the way I dealt with the fact that I didn't notice some things beforehand. So hopefully people feel like that's, that's fair. Um, any questions on this, this problem? What's that? Oh, how do you fix it? So you need special support from the kernel. So remember that this, uh, what I was hoping you would see is that this special yield is kind of like the park. And if I had a set park before I did the unlock, then that would fix the problem, right? Or you could even imagine some other call that just does it all, everything for me in the kernel. So any other questions on this one so far? Okay, so let's go back and 
questions are getting easier and easier. So now the average is up to 5.1. Now the average is 5.9. So this is question four. Um, let me see. What was question four? Yeah, I was I was kind of sad more people didn't get this because uh, we talked about uh, memory virtualization a lot, and also you did the project on this. Um, but basically, the problem here is that once you do a fork, you have a parent and a child, and those address spaces are completely different now. If you update one address space, you don't see that update in the other. So when the child when the child sets num here. The parent never sees that, right? What, what is it going to be in the parent? It'll be null, right? And we're going to do uh, a null pointer dereference, and, uh, and then we're going to crash in the parent. Right? So it's just bad code. Um, part, part of the motivation for having some of these questions like that, this are very similar to the project, is that we've heard in the past, when people have partners, they'll do something where they'll say, oh, like this partner does part A and the other partner does part B. Um, so I think by having questions like this, it kind of... Uh, uh, punishes that sharding of work. I want everybody to be thinking about both parts, right? So you learn the whole thing. So you can expect stuff like this again in the future, right? So it's not in your best interest to just divvy up the work. Everybody should be thinking about every piece of it. So any questions on that one? Okay, so let's move along. No, oh, why is this so big? Okay, so uh, question one. So let's head back to the exam. A lot of these you, you'll notice is kind of bimodal, right? Like people are getting a lot of zeros or tens. A lot of them was, it was kind of hard for me to uh, see how to give uh, extra credit. So maybe we need to think about how to make that more possible in the future. Um, but okay, so this one, basically th what this is saying is that uh, Shady OS is trying to provide this alternative to locking, right? It's basically saying that if you run it in this certain mode, We'll run everything on one CPU, and then you're fine because you don't have two threads running on different CPUs at the same time, right? So, and it's saying that they eliminate race conditions for, for that, right? So some people said that hurt performance, but I don't really think that's a good answer, right? Because that's not, they aren't caring about performance here. What they're basically saying is we're providing a tool that will make coding easier, but will hurt performance. So that's what Shady OS is trying to do. Um, what I was hoping you would say here is that even if you just have one core, you can still have race conditions because of the CPU scheduler. You can context switch at any time. Pretty much if you had the word context switch any, anywhere in your answer, um, you got full credit. Some people would write paragraph after paragraph and never really get to the crux of what's going on here. Um, so uh, I, I tried to figure out if, if you knew what was going on here. If you think you knew what was going on and I somehow missed that, you, we can talk more. But Basically, I wasn't looking for a complex answer. I just said, like, I wanted you to say that the scheduler can time text switch any time, and that could cause a race condition, and I would have been happy. So it's disappointed more people didn't get this, uh, right? Because this is a very, very key thing to understand about concurrency. So any questions so far? <coughs> All right, so let's look at the next question. So this is one is even more bimodal. Uh, so question five, oops. <clears throat> so, uh, this is a little bit tricky because um, our atomic primitive at this time doesn't return anything, uh, but basically this code was correct. Um, so let's see if we can walk through it. So we're basically, it's almost like the test in set before, right, where we would keep setting it to one and we would get the old value, okay? and. If it's already one and we set it to one, it doesn't really change. But if it was zero and we set it to one, then that means that we saw that at that instant in time it was unlocked, and now after that instant in time it is locked. Right? So this is very similar to the test and set, except instead of having a return value, um, that kind of returns an X. Right? So some people thought you might have to change something like put this inside of a loop, but uh, just know that, uh, I mean, if it fails, it was already one. Right? So this was all correct code. A bunch of people said you don't need this. Um, I didn't really give any points for saying that. That's usually true that you don't need it on a lot of modern x86 processors. Uh, some say like Penny and Pro processors or other, or other CPUs, um, you actually do need to do an atomic swap to set it to zero. Uh, so we haven't talked a lot of, about it a lot, but basically kind of in addition to making sure things don't run at the same time, 
You also have to worry about uh, CPU caches, right? If you have multiple cores, something could be in the cache of one but not the other. So different CPUs provide different guarantees about that. Um, and any, any of these atomic operations generally will, will have what's called a memory barrier. So basically any writes before uh, the memory barrier are visible afterwards to other people. So um, whether or not you pointed that out, I don't, I don't care, but you should just know that uh, you could usually get away without this, but sometimes you do need it. Uh, yeah, other people, it was tricky because they would say, oh, this is wrong, and then they would rewrite it to something else that was also right. So I didn't know what to do then. I, I think I would sometimes give like a couple points since you're writing something that's correct, even though you were wrong about the crux of the problem. So any questions about that one? Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So question 11. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. We only have a few more questions. Uh, so question 11 was the one um, on the page table translation. Okay, and, and basically all this was doing here is it gave you a bunch of virtual addresses, and most of these were correct, but some of them were wrong, and basically I wanted you to show me which ones were wrong, and then say what it should have been. So how can we reason through this? So we know that addresses are two bytes, and some of those bytes, or some of those bits, are going to be used as an offset within a page, and some of those are going to be used as an index, into, into both the page directory and pieces of the page table. Right, so the very first thing you should try to figure out is how many of these bits are used for, used for the offset. So what piece of information here helps you figure that out? Yeah. Uh, well, I was going to press the index of the page directory. You said because there's one page directory, uh -huh. 16 pieces long. Yeah. You can only use four bits and that's supposed to index that. Or right. Yeah, so yeah, let's run with that train of thought. You could work at this problem from the other direction, right? So I mean, one way you could do it is you could say how many bits are there for offset and then see how many are left over for indexes. Uh, he's saying let's start and see how many we need for indexes. So for indexes, we'll, we'll talk through that question first, right? There should be 16 uh, entries here. So for 16 entries, I need four bits to index into that, right? So that's four bits is just a nibble. Each of these... Uh, each of these... Um, uh, hex digits here is just a nibble, right? So, like, just one digit would be an index into the page directory, and then likewise for uh, the piece of the page table, right? So this would be an index into the page directory, and then this one would be an index into the page table, and the rest would be offset. Right, so that's one way you could do it, or you could work backwards and say, um, you could say, well, we know we have 256 uh, byte pages, so uh, assuming this is a byte addressable, we need eight eight bits for that, so then you could just say, well, I know that the lower two, uh, lower two nibbles here are for offset into a page. So questions so far? I thought somebody looked confused or was about to raise their hand. Okay, so I mean, let's just walk through, say, a couple of these and then hopefully you guys look at the idea. So this is zero, zero. Um, so first zero, uh, I look in, in the page directory and I see that goes to AA. So now I know which piece of the page table I want. So I want this piece, right? And then I take the second zero and that's here, and that's BB. So I would just get BB00 for the first one. So let's, let's do another one. So this is FFFF. Uh, well, actually, let's skip past that one because I don't want to like make you think that these are the same. It's a little bit confusing. So let's do this one. <coughs> 0, 1, 2, 3. So the 0 shows us again that it's this piece. And then the 1 shows us that it's the second entry here. So we basically would get 9, 9 for the physical page number. And then we would have 9, 9, 2, 3 because the offset always stays the same. <coughs> right? Um, so I mean, without even looking at the page table, like hopefully you could have told me that this was wrong, that the offset was changing across these. Right? So, who wants to see more, walk through more of these? Okay, nobody. So, I guess you can ask questions if it, if it doesn't make sense, but um, hopefully, hopefully it's, it's, it's not that confusing and you just forgot how, um, how to do it if you mix that one up. Uh, so, now we're on question two.
this was another one where I, I was like kind of disappointed that as many people got it wrong as, it, as they did because it was supposed to be a very straightforward question um, and something we, we did a lot of examples of in class and also talked significantly about in the textbook. But basically, what, what is this saying? It's saying that uh, for our timer interrupts, we're going to get rid of those and instead we're just going to have a register um, that has the current time in it and then if we want to know what time it is, we'll just check that thing. Right? So what, what's wrong with that? What? The process can completely take over the CPU and that to the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what, what you should be remembering from, from this is that you don't have the process and the OS running at the same time. Either one or the other is running, and you switch back and forth. And since if you're not running, you can't make something switch to you, right? So you need hardware support for that. And the support that's used is the timer interrupt. Right? So I mean some people thought like the timer interrupt was just for time. And that, that's not right. Like we need to have that so we can regain control and do a context switch when we want to. Um, so some people said some things that really bothered me. They said that, well, this will just be slower because now the OS has to spin until the register increases and then it'll context switch. And it's like, no, if it's uh, you aren't even, the OS is not even running. So, any questions on that? Okay, so question six. So, um, if you either read the chapter or went to that lecture, this is probably a pretty easy question. Uh, but basically, so there's a number of privileged operations that operating systems are supposed to use and that processes are not supposed to use, right? Because if you, if you can execute these things, you can take over the system, right? So it's perfectly reasonable here that we kill the process when it tries to run LIDT, right? That, that shady OS is doing the right thing here. Uh, what is not right is if you kill a guest operating system when that calls LIDT, because kind of like this idea of machine virtualization is that you can run any operating system you want on top of your on top of your system, right? So if you just want to grab any old operating system, well, operating systems are used to running directly on top of the hardware and using whatever they want. So uh, any guest operating system is probably going to call LIDT when it boots up. And if you kill that, well, then you can't run any guest operating system. So what you have to do is you, can't, you, you still can't let it do it because that would uh, let the guest OS take control of the system. We don't trust it. But basically what you have to do when the guest does anything privileged is you have to emulate it, right? So when the guest does this LIDT, that's going to trap to the host, Shady OS. And Shady OS should then see where the guest was trying to install that interrupt descriptor table. And don't actually let that happen, but remember where that place is, right? So then if, if Shady OS gets an interrupt, say a timer interrupt, you can choose to run the timer interrupt handler and the guest operating system if that's what you want to do. Or you could keep that interrupt for yourself and just switch what the which guest operating system is running. So any any questions on that? So some some people thought I was asking something different. They were saying uh, they thought I was asking what would happen if a process inside of a guest called LIDT. Um, so that's not what I meant, but if you kind of explain that clearly, you got points for um, answering that other question. So, okay. So, question seven. So, a lot. Most people are getting this one right. So that's good. Uh, so this this is an interesting thing. Like, uh, so basically, in normal multi-level feedback queue, uh, any new processes default to the highest priority, interactive priority, and if they prove themselves to be long-running batch processes, they get demoted to lower levels, right? And they only use what's kind of left over. So the only difference here is that this one is starting off processes at the lowest level, and then they can move up, right? So it's kind of similar, uh, but here's the tricky thing, right? So a normal MLFQ, you're innocent until proven guilty, and this one you're kind of guilty until proven innocent, right? So if you're a new interactive process and there's a lot of other interactive processes out ever already running, it might be very hard for you to ever get a turn to run 
and move up in the levels, right? And, and one person gave an especially nice answer. They said, let's say that you just have two processes and the first process runs and it yields, so it moves up a level. And after it yielded that one time, it never yields again. It runs nonstop. Nobody can ever take a turn then until the reset, right? Because that thing's at a higher level now and it can only go up and nobody else can move up because nobody else ever gets a chance to run to prove that they're also interactive, right? So it's almost this weird situation where we kind of determine whether you're interactive or batch based on observing your behavior. But if we default to not letting you run to start with, then we can't observe your behavior, right? So this is worse than MLFQ. Um, other things that are kind of strange about it is that for normal MLFQ, one of the things we added was accurate accounting, where instead of saying just let's demote you when you yield, we said let's demote you when you've used a certain amount of time, right? I don't think there's, people said, oh, well, just use accurate accounting in this one too. I don't think there is a direct equivalence, right? Because it's like you would promote you when you don't use a certain amount of time. Well, I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? So, uh, I mean, maybe there's some, some equivalent for accurate accounting in this version uh, that people alluded to. So I didn't dock points if you said that, but um, if, if you actually have a good idea there for how you do accurate accounting in this scheme, um, I'd be interested to hear what it, what it is. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about this. Yeah, I think, I think basically I gave people most of all the points, even if they just said that, oh, this doesn't do accurate accounting, um, so you can gain the system in that way. So I think it was pretty generous on this. So any questions? Okay, so let's move on. So a lot of people are getting this right now, but we'll go over it anyway. So question 10. Uh, so uh, what, what policy was this using instead of LRU? What's it? It was using, well, like we meant for it to be using FIFO, that's what we did. Um, maybe, maybe other policies would produce the same thing. One, one, a couple people said that it's using random policy, and I can't really argue with that, right, because who knows. Um, <laughs> but, but basically, as long as you said the uh, right cache date and whether it was a hit or miss, um, I was happy. But let me, let me see if I can remember where the first case was. So here, here was the first case where we did something wrong. We had to evict something, and we evicted one because one was first in, and so we pumped it out. So that was wrong, right? We, what we wanted to do is we wanted to evict, um, we wanted to evict the thing we hadn't used for a while, which was I forgot what was the thing we haven't used for a while. Um, so we haven't used two for a while, right? So we should have pumped out two instead. So I mean, it's, 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 the way you would look through for the cash chain in this kind of problem is I say, okay, I'm really look starting here, look back, and keep adding items to a set until I have three things, right? So I would say, here my cache state should have been four, one, three, okay? Or say, let's say, what, what should my cache state be right here? I would say my cache state should be three, one, four. Or wait, no, let, no let's say here. What would the cache state be here? I'd say one, four, three, right? So I'm just building a set of three by looking back in time. Because if you're evicting uh, the least recently used, that means you're caching the most recently used, right? So uh, hopefully that's not too hard to work through. And then, I mean, once you know the cache state, then I think determining whether or not you have hits or misses is um, pretty straightforward. So I mean, some people got, got it mostly right, and then they like, wrote the wrong thing for the hits or misses. So I think I deducted like one or two points for that. Um, but then if you, if you said something nice, like saying what the policy actually is here, like FIFO or something, um, then I would maybe give you um, some points back to compensate for your loss since you had a nice explanation. Uh, oh, that was actually the last question. So that was, LRU is the one that people did best at. So uh, just off, uh, let me take a quick survey. How many people think they're going to want to um, argue their grade? Okay, so just a couple people. So I think I won't set up any special event for this, but you could just come to office hours or grab me after class sometime and then we can discuss and... Uh, yeah, so that's it. So have a good day.